The Green Anglican Movement is our next um, session. We have uh, two people sharing a facilitation of this session. The first is Catherine, who is here. Catherine is not a stranger to uh, many of us. You may know her with the Mwangaza light. She may want to say something uh, a little more about that in a minute. Um, at some point, she would also invite uh, Dennis to share with her presentation of this session. To save time, let me leave it to her. If there are parts of introduction that you want to mention, Catherine, please feel free. Take us through this session now. Karibu. Thank you. Um, um, Your Grace, uh, Lord and Ladies, Bishops, um, good afternoon. We hope you still have a bit of energy to hear about Green Anglicans movement. We are all about energy and opportunities. So we hope that we can, we can bring good energy in this room uh, for the next half an hour. Uh, next slide, please. So what are we going to go through? We are going to, um, to go through a presentation which is an, a status update on what we are doing in Green Anglicans movement with you and with your dioceses and the opportunities that are ahead of us uh, right now. Um, first of all, I would like to send greetings from the bishops in, uh, in Denmark, from the Lutheran Evangelical Church. They were here in, uh, in February and were very happy to and, and thankful to be hosted by His Grace and by Bishop Bruto in, um, in El Guillermarquet. They came here to see what we are doing on Green Anglicans movement because they have been doing a green church movement in Denmark for about eight years and they were extremely impressed by the way that we have, we are growing this movement um, and we believe that uh, there are some good opportunities for partnerships ahead of us. First of all, I would like to take you through some of the environmental challenges that we are facing right now in Kenya and in East Africa, just to sort of set the scene of why do we have a Green Anglicans movement. We have a Green Anglicans movement because we see a lot of environmental change in terms of drought, in terms of flooding, um, and we know that ahead of us is um, the likelihood of a new El Nino. We know that more rains than what we have already had is going to cause more flooding. And we know that every time we see these environmental changes, people lose lives, they lose their livestock, they lose food. And so in the last couple of years, we've actually had the lowest food insecurity in Kenya in very many years. In the Green Anglicans movement, we are trying to make sure that the church does everything it can to turn around this situation. We also wanted just to bring to your attention some of the climate commitments that uh, the government of Kenya has made on behalf of all of us. First of all is to reduce the um, CO2 reductions by 32% by 2030. They also recently increased the, the commitment on the tree cover from 10% to 30 percent. So the original ambition of 10 percent was actually achieved last year while Uhuru was still in uh, leading the country so he could celebrate that achievement and I think the Green Anglicans movement and the church should be proud that we have contributed at least five, six hundred thousand trees to that tree cover. The government has also uh, committed themselves to provide universal access to clean cooking. And I'll come back to why they have made that kind of commitment. Then they have also made a commitment to mobilize their own resources for climate change. And that is actually new. In the first commitments that the government made, um, it was solely relying on external funding. And now the government has made a, a commitment to raise 13% of the $62 billion that is required during the next 10 years. So some of the key actions that the government has committed to is to grow 5 billion trees. 
Um, they are saying if every Kenyan will plant 10, 100 trees, we will reach that number. They have also, as one of the first countries in Africa, started working on a national clean cooking strategy and where they want to give a diversity of fuels. Like you can see, we also have the display outside. The government is focusing a lot on LPG and electric cooking. They're doing a lot also in terms of adaptation, in terms of making more, using innovation to become more climate resilient. And the government is actually taking this to the continental level. And we would like to introduce you to the, the part of the PowerPoint presentation that the government has um, shared about the upcoming African Climate Summit in September. It's a great honor that we are going to host this, uh, this summit. And as a church and a movement, we want to be very um, active in it. What is very interesting is that the government is trying to change the narrative of the effects of climate change on Africa. So they're trying to change the traditional narrative that Africa is suffering from climate change and it is just making things worse. So they're not saying that we should not have loss and damage. But what they are saying is, let's change it. Let's change that narrative. Next slide, please. So that we actually start talking about what is the opportunity for Africa when we are looking at climate change. We know that in this world, the big producers, the large economies, they emit a lot of uh, greenhouse gases. So the way that their, in, their industries are set up is that the more growth you have as a society, uh, economic growth, the higher the emissions. So the government here is trying to change that narrative and say what we need in this world, in this only planet that we have, is we need positive growth countries. That means we need to have countries where we are growing the economies, we are growing the industries, we are improving our infrastructure, but we are doing it in a climate smart manner. That means we are going to use clean energy, we are going to use different technologies that do not emit. So in the end, it will actually be good for the whole world that it is Africa that produces to the rest of the world. That is the ambition with this summit. They are going to look at a whole range of topics that we have included because we find it very inspiring that there are so many areas that we can work on when we want to work on environmental change and reduce the impact of climate change. As you can see in the table, it is about food, it's about water, it's about infrastructure, it's about transport. It is about how we live our everyday lives, but it's also about what investments do we make. Imagine, for example, if dioceses, they actually had charging stations for electric cars. Imagine that we, we started turning to electric cars and then the, the church actually became a place where you could charge your electric car that pollutes so much less than many other types of cars. Imagine like there's so many opportunities that we can use in our agriculture, in our housing, and generally in our investments. With those few remarks, I would like to hand over to Reverend Dennis, who will take us more to look at the opportunities we are pursuing in the Green Anglicans movement. Thank you. Um, praise the Lord, uh, my Lord and Lady Bishops. It's um, a great privilege to stand here before you today to share with you some of the things that we are celebrating. And uh, as she has say, said rightfully, um, we are celebrating the status of the Green Anglican Movement, which you have enabled to get onto the global platform. And when you get to meet with all our brothers and sisters across the communion, and even outside the Anglican Church, they are singing about the Green Anglican Movement. One tear fund uh, worker 
was going around trying to recruit churches to join a movement uh, for the environment lately. And every door he was going knocking on, she would be told, please refer to the Green Anglican Movement. They are the ones who we are working with. They will be asked, do you have a policy to show that you are working with the environment? Again, they will say, Green Anglican Movement have the policy paper that show what the church is doing concerning the environment. And all this today, we want to say a big thank you to His Grace and the great support that you've gotten from all the dioceses. If today you would look at one of the WhatsApp groups that uh, was started by ADS, from the beginning when we started mid last month up to this time, we have so many pictures of you planting trees, your congregants planting trees, and they are not shy about it. In fact, they are praising you for the support that you are giving them. And for that, today, we come to say a big thank you for what you are doing for the Green Anglican Movement. And more so to His Grace, who started it all when he envisioned a wholesome church for a wholesome nation, which I know by now we all know how we summarize it. And because of time, I really wanted to have all of us stand and we see whether we've memorized it because I've traveled with him and wherever he goes, he mentions it. He mentions it. That at the end of the day, what he wants to see in a full Christian is Jesus in the heart, the right knowledge in the mind. I see we know it. Do we stand up and do a bit of exercise and stretching? Thank you very well, very much. So this is how he says it. He wants to see Jesus in the heart, the right knowledge in the mind, food in the stomach, the work, the hands that are ready to work, right? Together with the environment, so that we get money for the what? Have I said it well, Your Grace? <laughs> Asante. Asante. Thank you. So, since the inception of the decade strategy, if you all have been uh, looking at it, in the year 2026, we shall be celebrating the wholesome ecology. And we said as a committee that sits under ADS that we would not like to get to 2026 and we start working towards saving the environment. We want to get to 2026 and celebrate what we have done for the environment. And for that, we decided we are going to put on targets. And one of the targets that we put out there was to do 15 million trees by 2026. And by the way, we are moving right now from diocese to diocese. I say we are going to surpass this little target and we are actually looking at almost 30 to 45 million trees by the end of 2026. And for that, we give thanks to the clear vision that we have as an Anglican church. Earlier this year, His Grace told us as a committee that he would like to challenge us to not think of only provincial, but go down to the congregational level. And from this level through ADS, we decided to come down to three areas in our fair country. We went to Limuru, where we got about 30 uh, train trainees who we call our champions. We went to Mombasa, Likoni area, where we got another around 25 to 30 uh, priests and laity coming together for training. Again, we left there and went to Western and got again another big team of people who came for training. And all this has brought some tremendous um, growth in the Green Anglican uh, circles. But with all this, we'd like to say it would not have been possible if you would not have approved the governance structure that we put out in 2022. And just as a reminder, it will tell us that the bishops will become the ambassadors, the archdeacons, the chaplains, and the clergy and the laity, the champions. And since then, we can attest that we are seeing some great and mighty things happening on the ground. So what we've been doing with these um, volunteers that you've sent for us to train is that we've trained them on the way of ADS. Show them what ADS does. And also tell them that it is under ADS that the Green Anglican Movement resides. Apart from that, we've also shared with them the Green Anglican Movement governance structure, which by now I believe they know it pretty well. 
Apart from that, we also did a bit of certification to tell them that in the future, we are looking at ways of how we are going to award some of these churches that are performing exceptionally well. Maybe a church that decided to go off-grid. I'm waiting to, to see the first one. To stop using electricity and consider solar. A church that has decided to go completely paperless. Not for the sake of saving money, but for the sake of saving the trees. That is what we would like to start celebrating. Small wins as we uh, continue growing as a movement. Apart from that, we also shared with them eco-theology. Eco-theology is one thing that we realized was of great thirst to our, not only the Christians, but also to our priests. And I say this having gone through one of the most prestigious schools uh, of theological training, that is St. Paul's. And in it, I remember we had one class that we called environmental issues. It was good but not good enough to give theologians an opportunity to sit down and interact with the word of God in light of the environment. We had every discipline put in one class discussing matters environment, but it was not good enough. And that's why we feel from the feedback that we have received that we want to see more and more. I remember from the trainings that we have had, there are some few um, interactions that we had. For example, there's somebody who mentioned Luke chapter 10 verses 29 that reminded us, and who is your neighbor? And he was good enough to tell us that back in the Garden of Eden, if God would have asked us, who is your neighbor? That is to Adam and Eve. That would, be, that would have been the environment. So today, this young person reminded us that look at the person who is in need the most, who you'd consider your neighbor, and you'll find the environment is wanting. Somebody else also came up with Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. We gave them little challenges to think about um, the special relationship between uh, uh, man and the environment, the parable of the talent. And this is what he had to say, that in the parable of the talent, we see a master coming and giving out talents and disappearing. And somebody said, yes, yes, and the story of man and God is almost the same. And this uh, theologian told us that not really so. Because in the parable of the talent, we look at a master who lives, but when we come to the relationship of God giving man the opportunity of being called a steward and us taking care of the environment, he never disappears. He's actually there with us. And these and many other uh, thoughts have been cropped out of the eco-theology that we have been going through. Apart from that, we also brought along uh, a worker from the communion forest. The communion forest is what we consider to be the green Anglican in the wider communion uh, of the Anglican church. And he shared with us the great dreams that they have. But of course, we know that Kenya did a great number in inspiring what they are doing right now. So apart from that, we also want to give a, a proper um, salutation by sharing a picture that is on the wall. This is what we shared with uh, the lady and the clergy who came to this training. And I would like to pose this challenge to you today. If you can look at that picture, it is a picture that depicts stewardship. And I would like you to just have a look at it. It is in your papers as well, just in case it is not clear enough. And tell me, which one do you think represents the ideal shape of stewardship? When we are told that we have dominion over everything in this world, what shape do you think will depict the ideal? And if you have an answer, please just raise your hand and share with us. We'd like to hear and give us a reason to why you feel that particular shape represents the best ideal for stewardship. That is the first one, the second one, and the third one. Because of time, let me save you. Uh, we have the first one. If you see man is on top there. Yes, man is special in the eyes of God. But God has taught us, even he himself being supreme, 
he came down through his son Jesus Christ to come and serve. So when we put ourselves on top of the animals, we are only showing them domination. But that is not really love. That is not the letter of love. The second one puts man in the bodies of all the animals. That almost comes close to what the Hindus would consider their way of worship, where everything is one. But we know the truth that that is not the case. Man is a little bit special. But his role is not one that dominates over other creation, but his role is to support the rest of creation. That is why the last one, which is the most ideal, is in the shape of love. And man is seen down there. And to be, I was very surprised by some of your clergy who started sharing the issues of gender in this particular picture. And that's not what we were looking for. We were looking at the ideal picture and image of stewardship. So probably you can ponder on that as I call my sister Catherine to continue. Thank you. We have four thematic areas in Green Anglicans movement. We have eco-theology, we have tree growing, we have clean energy adoption and waste management. So Reverend Dennis was looking at thematic area one. I will take you through thematic area two and three. So for tree growing, we would like to just return a bit to the communion forest. The communion forest is um, a very special way of bringing together spirituality and tree growing. It was launched at Lambeth, and I'm sure that those who are here who went to Lambeth would actually be in a much better position to introduce it. But what it is all about is actually the three principles that they say to plant is to hope, to protect is to love, to restore is to heal. It's all about bringing together spirituality and, and creation. So we are not just planting trees because it is the right thing to do from an environmental perspective. We are planting trees because, and the way we are doing it, we are praising God and it is part of who we are as Anglicans. Part of what we do is planting trees. So it is with that combination of spirituality and tree growing that we would like uh, to promote the communion forest way of planting trees uh, here. And we would like to, to promote tree growing by actually also uh, promoting new ways of doing it. This is the first time, I think for some, maybe two years, where we have not had tree seedlings ready for you. And we haven't, because we would like to encourage you to go home and set up tree nurseries and get your own tree seedlings. It's not to be cheeky, it's just the way to get started. So for tree growing, there are so many benefits from trees. There's a benefit of land restoration, enhance biodiversity, improve air, reduce soil erosion, enhance soil fertility so we can produce more and better food, access to fruit, to timber, cooking fuel, job creation, and also income to the church. So we should, we should be growing trees for the benef all those benefits of trees. And the way we believe is we can actually set it up as green economies that we can set up tree nurseries on church land. These tree nurseries can be managed by young people and they can thereby also create jobs. Tree planting is part and can become more part of worship, of functions and special days. To allocate sections of church land for prayer gardens, for forest and for land restoration. And then to integrate tree growing into schools. We have an amazing opportunity at the schools where we have all these little young heads that we can really nurture to make small environmentalists. So imagine that if every child that starts in an Anglican school starts by planting a couple of trees. Those trees are named by that kid. And that kid is responsible 
for actually nurturing them while he or she is in school. They will be big when the kid has finished primary school. And that will be the mark of I was here in terms of school. No more scratching on the walls. Instead, let them produce trees. And we can make it part of the environmental education in schools. So the schools are an amazing opportunity, but also that the church is one of the biggest landowners in this country. You have a lot of land, and on that, that land, we can grow a lot of trees. We would like to invite you to become part of a national large-scale uh, tree growing program where we are trying to do it in this way, that it is focusing on job creation, on biodiversity, on food security, on having access to sustainable timber. And we would like to try and set it up, and I say try because this is something we haven't done before, but we would like to try and set it up in a way of using smart climate financing, also known as carbon credits. That what happens is that after the trees are big, after we have nurtured the trees and they are big, we can actually start claiming carbon credits. Those credits can actually go back to the institutions that give the land. That means that we can actually use smart climate finance to develop our schools, to develop our churches, to do so much more. So that is something we are looking into as a church. Moving on to the thematic area three is about adoption of clean energy solutions. And uh, your grace, I have to say thank you again for the Green Anglicans Cookstoes. That is one unique way of everybody to know the Green Anglicans movement. When we speak with colleagues in the Interreligious Council, the first thing they say, ah, we love your chicos, they are beautiful. Uh, I also want to use this opportunity to say thank you to Bishop Wandera for carrying an Anglican, a green Anglican cook stove to Lambeth and handing it over to the General Secretary, which means that it is now in the office in England. So we are really trying to, to move the Jikos, and why are we doing it? We are doing it because, as you can see on the first picture, the traditional cook stoves, this one is from uh, Elgio Maraquet, it's a Chip Cooper, where when a woman cooks, that actually gives out a lot of smoke. It actually gives out so much smoke that when she cooks three meals a day on that cook stove, she inhales toxic fumes equivalent to smoking two full packets of cigarettes. Right? That is actually the health hazard that women go through to cook. We also know that women spend around five to six hours a day cooking. That is what we call unpaid domestic labor. Imagine what a woman can do when she actually frees one or two hours a day because her cook stove cooks faster, because she doesn't have to walk so far for firewood, or she doesn't have to spend so much money on buying the cooking fuel. We have seen examples where reverence uh, from Diocese of Eldoret, where we have moved a little further on the, on the green Anglican cook stoves, and they are actually telling us that they have women who have converted from other churches to the Anglican church because of the cook stoves, because they could see that the church cared for what is really what women are struggling with. We also have reverends who are telling us that the church attendance on Sundays have increased because the women are not ill and they don't go for as much pastoral care because the respiratory problems have reduced. So looking into clean energy solutions, something as simple as cook stoves can really make a difference. The way we also view them is that it's an entry point for a household to leave behind the traditional cook stove and get into what we call the clean energy ladder. That they actually start enjoying the very many benefits of clean energy and that when they start saving money from 
moving from the traditional cook stove to an improved cook stove, then they can, they can start using that saving to also expand their energy in terms of solar solutions so they can get access to reliable energy, which is something that 30% of the household in this country does not have access to. No solar, no, uh, no grid. So we have 30% of the people in this country who need clean energy today. We can see that when we work uh, with Green Anglicans movement, we can actually reach what is otherwise unserved markets. And we can see that because more than 90% of the cook stove customers, this is the first time they've got an improved cook stove. So our ambition is that we journey with them up the clean energy ladder, which basically means that we enable households to have access to the energy that they need in order to live a good life and increasingly improve their way of living. So by starting with, an, with a, something as simple as a cook stove, we can actually then work with the household and give them more and more uh, solar batteries and panels that in the end they can actually run an electric induction, induction cook stove that will not give out any smoke at all. So it is a journey that we walk together. Then we are also looking at solarizing institutions and schools. Uh, this is a picture taken uh, some time back uh, with the solar uh, public address system that is used in, um, in Cajado uh, for an outdoor uh, service. As part of connecting more with nature, maybe it's good also to have more worship that is outside. But this PA system also works inside. And we, are, we would like to start working more on solarizing schools and uh, providing reliable, clean, and cheaper energy for the operation. That can give an opportunity to actually train young people as energy auditors who can actually do the whole groundwork and we can get them more into that, um, that level of skill training. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, she has talked on the two thematic areas. I would like to finalize with the last one, which is waste management. And I would like to start by reminding you of something that we all know, that it is the most vulnerable that are affected by the climate change. And not only that, even when it comes to this pollution, the garbage waste and all that, it is the poorest of the poor that are affected mostly by it. We recently were invited to go to Korogosho, where they normally do the dump site uh, of Nairobi. And for sure, you will find women, children in the Nairobi River, as black as it is, trying to wash these paper bags, wanazitanga chibukati these paper bags so that they can take them back to the market so that you can come later, buy your sukuma, and go eat at home. It was the most saddest picture I've ever seen in my life. But those people are making a living. And it is also affecting us who are not in these particular places. And for that reason, we have realized as a Green Anglican movement, we have not made a lot of stride in waste management. But we would like to inspire you this uh, afternoon to consider some of the ways that we can change our way of waste management. Because let's face it, we have been told that all these plastics are coming from homes, not from factories. They are coming from my home and your home. So what can we do to reduce the waste that is going out? At the end of the day, we are being reminded that this Nairobi River is being weighted for, by people who are along the Tana River that is going to transform into drinking water and all that. What can we do about pollution uh, in this particular time and age? And because you've not done much, I would like to share. There's somebody who said, he's called um, Dr. Dave Bookless. Uh, do not let the name fool you. He has written a lot of books. He's just called Bookless. He said that you cannot trust a farmer who does not smell of goat. So for us to share what we are trying to do, I'm going to take you to the residence of the Archbishop, 
where he has been kind enough for us to start a small project that is going to form uh, what we would like to see a model home in an Anglican setup. When I went to, to, to live at his grace's residence, I realized because where we used to live, I used to just remove trash, and I never cared where it, go, where it went because nobody told me to look for papers to fill this uh, 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 trash. Then when we went here, we were told that every week there's somebody on Thursday who is going to come and pick your waste. So we had to buy paper bags and fill them every week. And we realized by the time a week was ending, because of my children, we are eating and they are wasters. I can say that. We realized that we were almost throwing out two to three paper bags full of waste. So we had to come up with something because it is money. Every paper is money. So we had to come up with something. And for us, we considered this little animal, uh, or rather insect, that we call the black soldier fly. The black soldier fly, we introduced it uh, back in June last year. And since then, this little uh, magnificent work of uh, uh, God's work, it takes all the food that we waste from our kitchen and turns it into very good fertilizer that we put in the uh, uh, green uh, space that we have where we get to plant our greens. Apart from that, in their larvae stage, when they are eating, they also get to feed our chicken, which is a very good source of protein. Apart from that, when they turn black in their pupa stage, we get to take them, put them in a dark place where they have a, a more um, environment that is friendly for them to change into the flies, to become adults, for them to lay eggs, for us to start the whole cycle again. What am I trying to say? We are trying to encourage our Christians to reduce their waste, to reuse their waste, and to recycle their waste. How have I reduced my waste? I've reduced the amount of waste that goes to the Nairobi city. I have lessened the burden for the county. And we are imagining if this happened in every Anglican home, if we had our own churches being spaces, having collection points for our people to come and bring plastics for us to go and recycle, for our people to come and find these black soldier flies to come and feed their waste. And trust you me, if you can come to his grace's place, you'll not feel any stench because they take care of the stench in the environment. They take care of the rottingness of what you'll find in a normal setup of uh, trash. So we would like to put this out unto you because the Green Anglican from the provincial side has not yet hacked it yet. Can you come up with ingenious ways of reducing your waste, reusing your waste, and recycling your waste? And if you require any help from the main office, please feel free to get us through the ADS. And so we'd like to just discuss the what are we looking at as we move forward as Green Anglican movement? One, we are hoping for those who have not yet set up GAM governance structures in the diocesan levels to please to consider doing it as soon as possible because we are in conversation with every person in your diocese that you have given us as a champion and we are seeing some great good coming out of it. Training of clergy and other church leaders on eco-theology so that once in a while on a pulpit like this one, we can have our Christians get to hear of how they need to relate with the environment so that we do not keep on this old way of just reading the Bible through the egocentric way, the anthropocentric eyes that we get to do and it is not our, our liking. It is a bias that we have because it is a training that we had. Apart from that, we are also requesting us to set up green economies. Tree growing is one of the ways. We have said that we do not want to bring trees anymore. We want for you to start the tree nurseries, and then we start reaching out to people who are looking for trees to come and buy in your areas. And that will give our young people an opportunity to get something or rather money in the pocket, as His Grace uh, puts it. 
We also want to ask you to uh, help in the promotion of green Anglican cookstoves and other clean energy solutions at church, school, and circles. They are here. Please feel free to pass by the tent and look at some of the ingenious things that they have. There is a TV that runs on solar. I thought I would be the first one to get it.